This is the eighth and final part of Questioning Oshalan's Jewish Question by Chaya Heller, investigating the anti-Jewish racism in the writings of Abdullah Oshalan. Conclusion How the left perpetuates and can challenge anti-Jewish racism. As I've illustrated here, Oshalan's imagined Jews are a class and state-like body that have the power to make or break the world itself. If Jews would only choose to use their immense financial and political power to promote socialism, anarchism, feminism and ecology, then humanity could win. If Jews fail to do so, humanity loses and the leftist project is, quote, impossible. My concern in writing this essay is twofold. I've tried to make the anti-Jewish racism in Oshalan's writings visible so that others can better understand and identify anti-Jewish narratives when they see them. My second concern has been to explore the network of people that brought Oshalan's writings from his hands to the reader's eyes. I'll try here to make a case for why leftists reading this text might consider inserting themselves into this network, responding to the people who brought Oshalan's anti-Jewish racist words to them. There's nothing particularly remarkable about a 73-year-old man raised in Turkey reproducing 19th century racist tropes about Jewish people that he learned while coming of age in the Turkish left. What is remarkable is that his racist tropes are circulating out in the world in 2022, now 2024, with little response. After reading Oshalan's writings about Jewish people, one social ecology scholar who is also a scholar of anti-Semitism said to me, What blows my mind is that this stuff lived to see the light of day. This is the kind of thing you just bury and hope no one will ever find. Written 11 to 14 years ago in Turkish, Oshalan's writings on Jewish ideology, in quotes, from the sociology of freedom, would have remained unknown to the English-speaking world if a network of people in the US and Europe didn't step up to actively choose to translate, edit, authorise, publish, publicly endorse, promote and circulate the text. Books possess a materiality that makes their, quote, networks of production visible. Networks appear simply by examining a book's front and back cover, as well as pages of copyright and archival data, listing authors, book series editors, translators, publishers, book blurbers, forward writers, as well as the various dates, places and terms of publication. Less visible are networks of reception that include those who read, review, discuss, defend and critique books once they've left the press. Public reviewers, positive or negative, are visible nodes of book networks as people identify and critique both text and those who facilitate textual production. I conducted both formal and informal interviews with people in both networks of production and reception surrounding Oshalan's writings about Jewish people. Out of 31 interviews, two main kinds of responses to Oshalan's anti-Jewish writings surfaced in these encounters. A small minority, two people, said that they didn't recognise the anti-Jewish content of Oshalan's writings while a majority said they clearly saw it, but would never admit it publicly. In January of 2021, I joined a small ad hoc group of nine social ecologists associated with the Institute for Social Ecology to discuss Ocelan's writings. Because people in these discussions used the term anti-Semitism rather than anti-Jewish racism, I'll use the former term here for the sake of ling linguistic fidelity. At our first meeting, we decided collectively to write a short reflection piece about the anti-Semitism in Ocelan's writings. The group also welcomed a member's recommendation that we meet with two leaders in the Kurdish freedom movement and two scholar activists involved with the Kurdish freedom movement. Henceforth, I'll refer to this group of four as Ocelan scholars. 
In January and March of 2021, four social ecologists from our group of nine spent a total of four hours in two Zoom meetings with the four Oshalan scholars. All four were unable or unwilling to identify or acknowledge the anti-Semitism in Oshalan's writings. The Oshalan scholars dismissed our group's concerns about Oshalan's writing and expressed anger that we had determined the writing anti-Semitic, even though two members of our group are scholars of anti-Semitism, Peter Staudenmeyer and Rob Ogman, who hold PhDs related to and teach on the subject. The Oshalan scholars explained that once we fully appreciated Oshalan's complex and unique theoretical approach to analysing Jewish people, we too would see Oshalan's writing about Jewish people as dialectical and beautiful, rather than anti-Semitic. They recommended that our group of social ecologists refrain from publishing any statement about the anti-Semitic content in Oshalan's writing, which we had already drafted. At the end of the second dialogue, the Oshalan scholars said that even though they saw no anti-Semitism in Oshalan's writing, they would do three things to address our concerns. They'd bring our concerns to Oshalan, who might modify his critique of Jewish people, as he'd previously done for Armenians after they publicly challenged his unfavourable writings about them. Second, they would create an educational exchange with the Institute for Social Ecology and Rojava University, which in some way might raise awareness about anti-Semitism. Third, they said that they would continue to do more Zoom dialogues with our group to keep the lines of communication open. Nearly two years later, there's been no follow-through. Our group did receive a final email from the Oshalan scholars in May of 2021, reconfirming that they would never accept that Oshalan's writing was anti-Semitic. These Zoom dialogues between Oshalan scholars and social ecologists had a ripple effect, as the four social ecologists who had met with the Oshalan scholars consulted with other social ecologists and leftists about how to best do educational outreach work that could raise awareness on the left about Oshalan's anti-Semitic writings and left anti-Semitism generally. Jewish people within various social ecology circles found themselves pitted against each other, in some cases eroding decades-long friendships and working relationships. Some Jewish social ecologists felt demoralised by comrades in their social ecology study groups and organisations who felt that, out of fears of bringing negative attention to both the Kurdish freedom movement and Jewish people, they must abide by the request to cease speaking or, or writing about it publicly. Difficult conversations resulted in several Jewish leftists leaving a social ecology group, with one group member vowing to cut political ties to the left generally. More troubling were conversations with individuals in study groups and political forums in the United States and Europe who tried but failed to address the anti-Jewish racist content of Oshalan's writing. Many of these people related to me their stories of reaching out to Kurdish leadership who dismissed their concerns as baseless. One leader in the Kurdish movement even went as far as to say to them, quote, when I first read Oshalan's writing about Jews, I too was troubled by it, but then, over time, I came to understand and appreciate his dialectical approach to understanding Jewish people, as well as his approach to even Kurdish people." End quote. Perhaps most harrowing to me were the stories from seven Jewish individuals I interviewed who expressed pain at having their worst fears about Jews confirmed by Oshalan's writing. Even if they felt that this writing was anti-Semitic, they nonetheless internalised its narratives about a special relationship between capitalism and Jews as an unfortunate historical truth. Subtitle Five Reasons Why the Left Needs to Address Anti-Jewish Racism Ochelan's Sociology of Freedom provides an overview of what antique 19th century anti-Jewish racist tropes look like. The book's publication and the lack of response to its racist content is a reminder that the left indeed has an anti-Jewish racism problem. I'll conclude here with five main reasons why anti-Jewish racism is a serious problem for the left. 1. Left anti-Jewish racism makes the left a target for external meddling. Left quietism about anti-Jewish racism makes the left vulnerable to divisive polarisation from both inside and outside leftist movements. 
This is because while leftists might not see anti-Jewish racism as an important issue, the right does. The right knows exactly how to weaponize existing left anti-Jewish racism, using it to increase infighting among leftists that fragments already tenuous movements. One example of this was the deepening of existing rifts within the organizing committee of the Women's March. In 2017, upward of 4 million people gathered in one of the largest single-day mobilizations in US history, which should have launched an impactful wave of feminist organizing. But it didn't. We can point to a number of causes, but significant among them was the unwavering public support by Women's March co-chair Tamika Mallory for Louis Farrakhan, leader of the Nation of Islam, known for a long history of racist and anti-Jewish statements that include rants about powerful, satanic Jews. Other March organisers stood by her, responding defensively and dismissively to the issue as a distraction. Positive media generated by the event fizzled while outrage at anti-Jewish racism, some genuine, some opportunistic, overpowered public discourse about the event, including a wave of Russian Twitter bot activity against the Women's March. Similar dynamics can be seen in Jeremy Corbyn's electoral loss in the UK. This was at least in part due to the left's unwillingness to address incidents of anti-Jewish racism within the Labour Party, which their opponents in the Conservative Party and even within the old Labour Party bureaucracy were able to exploit in the lead up to the election. Had leftists working with Corbyn or the Women's March addressed anti-Jewish racism in their organisations before a crucial election or a historical march, the outcomes of these crises may have been very different. It has indeed consistently proven to be the left's Achilles heel, a site of vulnerability for outside forces who seek to weaponise the left's anti-Jewish racism against itself. 2. Left anti-Jewish racism feeds conspiracy theories, obscuring understandings of actual power and Jewish realities. Hannah Arendt explains that authoritarianism thrives when publics are long exposed to propagandistic lies that engender a culture of gullibility and cynicism. When publics are pummeled for years by incomprehensible lies, they come to accept a lie one day, retreating the next into cynicism, if the lie is disproved. Instead of challenging leaders who lie, publics simply say they know all leaders lie, admiring leaders they like, who they see as using lies tactically and cleverly. Fascist leaders like Trump successfully use lie-driven conspiracy theories, creating publics who often know he's lying, but cynically admire his ability to achieve his goals by lying. Anti-Jewish racism is a set of lies about Jewish histories and realities so long-standing and pervasive that they are taken for granted as true. Oshelan is seemingly sincere, believing his racist writings about Jews are an accurate account. As the centrepiece to most conspiracy theories of power, anti-Jewish racism erodes the left's ability to distinguish facts from fiction and lies from truth. When leftists deny that Ocalan could possibly write anything anti-Semitic, they are perhaps so long exposed to lies about Jewish people that they simply accept his conspiratorial writing about them as factual. When others admitted to knowing that Ocalan's writing contained anti-Semitic lies but said they would never publicly admit it, they too enacted Arendt's ideas about lying and power. They lapsed into cynicism, accepting lying as a strategic necessity for the good of the movement. But this is a trap, only perpetuating the conspiratorial thinking that undergirds the authority and authoritarian regimes they seek to counter. Theories of Jewish power serve only as a mask for the actual dynamics of capital and state power. 3. Left anti-Jewish racism weakens leftist organisations by alienating Jewish leftists. For many cultural, historical and religious reasons, Jewish people are often drawn to the left, yet they are often demoralised when organisations fail to address instances of anti-Jewish racism both within their movements and in the outside world. 
Unaddressed anti-Jewish racism can leave Jewish leftists feeling forced to choose between fighting their own oppression or commitment to a left that continuously ignores or rationalises that oppression. Leftists who value the contributions of their Jewish comrades could create inclusive organisational policies sensitive to dynamics that emerge between Jews and among Jews and non-Jews when issues of anti-Jewish racism inevitably emerge. When non-Jewish leftists step up as allies speaking out against instances of anti-Jewish racism within and outside of left spaces, Jewish, Jewish peoples aren't left in the crosshairs fighting alone. As David Baddiel notes, the left generally supports ethnic minorities to define the features of racist speech or action directed at their group. Yet leftists often deny this right to Jewish leftists, obliging them to debate with non-Jews about the validity of their definition of anti-Jewish racism. Moreover, when leftists don't include anti-Jewish racism in an intersectional analysis of racism generally, everyone loses out. The left is deprived of the opportunity to develop an understanding of anti-Jewish racism as a form of oppression that often undergirds white supremacy, nativism, transphobia and other dangerous forces that attack many non-Jewish marginalised people. In turn, Jewish leftists are deprived of a sense of belonging in a left that cares about its Jewish members, with the left weakened by the absence of their otherwise potential contributions. Four. Left anti-Jewish racism puts Jewish people in danger. Although many leftists don't regard anti-Jewish racism as a significant intersectional form of racism, statistics indicate otherwise. Since 2015, when Trump began his presidential campaign, anti-Jewish racist incidents have increased considerably. There were more in the United States in 2021 than any other time during the past 40 years. While it is difficult to ignore mass killings like the 2019 Tree of Life massacre in Pittsburgh or chants of Jews will not replace us at the 2017 Unite the Right march, the public is generally becoming desensitised to frequent acts of Jew hatred that result in injuries and vandalism of Jewish spaces but yield fewer deaths. Furthermore, anti-Jewish racism isn't just a problem in the United States. It is steadily rising globally, reaching record highs in countries including Australia, Britain, Canada, France and Germany. At times, these racist attacks tap into or are generated by political conflict about Israel-Palestine due to a widespread acceptance of the conflation of the Jewish religion and non-Israeli Jewish people with the State of Israel. In 2021, 345 of 2,717 Jew-hating incidents in the United States referenced the words Israel and Zionism. Orthodox and Hasidic Jewish people living outside Israel are lightning rods for hatred and violence as their clothing make them more identifiable than assimilated or secular Jewish people. 5. Left anti-Jewish racism keeps the left from successfully becoming a fully anti-racist movement capable of fighting white nationalism. Over the past few decades, white leftists have increasingly realised that fighting white supremacy is central to any left agenda. The rise of the Black Lives Matter movement is, in particular has underlined what the civil rights and black power movements emphasised years ago. Fighting anti-black and brown racism is necessary to any attempt to create a truly democratic and ecological world. The left will only succeed in fighting the white nationalist movement if it also confronts anti-Jewish racism, as it is a linchpin of the white nationalist agenda. As Eric K. Ward explains, white nationalism rose in response to gains made by black and brown people in the 1960s. White nationalism uses anti-Jewish racism to claim that gains made by black and brown people, as well as by women and LGBTQ plus peoples, must have been orchestrated by Jews, as these groups lack the power and cleverness to do it on their own. He goes on to argue that challenging white supremacy requires fighting anti-Jewish racism because it not only unites the right, it can unite the right with the left as well. This happens when leftists set aside a structural analysis of capitalism 
in favour of a conspiratorial one, where Jewish people are imagined as the source of society's problems due to their insatiable lust for financial and political power. The facts of history are irrelevant. It doesn't matter that before the Holocaust, the vast majority of European Jewry were powerless and lived in impoverished rural shtetls. It doesn't matter that most Jewish people permitted to immigrate to the United States between 1880 and 1920 were equally powerless, fleeing pogroms as well as political, educational and vocational exclusion. It doesn't matter that these powerless Jewish immigrants would eventually lose two-thirds of their European family members during the Holocaust because the United States closed its doors to Jewish immigrants at the end of the 1920s. The only thing that counts is that Jewish people in the US became an increasingly visible minority in the 1960s and were gradually afforded a provisional whiteness that allowed them to join the American middle class. As history bears out, Jewish people's white privilege is utterly rescindable. Popular rage about mythological Jewish power can always take Jews down. In conclusion, Ochelan was wrong about Jewish people. Rather than constitute a unified and monolithic entity, they are a diverse multiplicity organised along a wide array of ethnic, political and religious lines. Jewish people share no common ideology or power that destroys society while driving governments into genocidal rage. Jewish people are neither responsible for the left's greatest achievements nor for its greatest failures. Leftists need to be able to identify and confront anti-Jewish racism when they see it. They also need to be able to replace erroneous racist myths about Jewish people with real Jewish histories. If leftists choose to become educated about Jewish history and the history of anti-Jewish racism, there is hope for the left to become a more fully anti-racist movement.